Amen. Uh, I wanted to do this uh, video teaching here today um, uh, so that I could uh, continue uh, with some thoughts that um, I didn't quite get to uh, in a teaching that I did. I'm going to fix this camera a little bit. Uh, to finish some thoughts on a teaching that I did at Fearless Life Ministries that I put on the channel called um, Freedom from the Law. And uh, in that, what we were saying was that freedom from sin is freedom from the law. Um, the scripture says that uh, sin shall not have dominion over us shall not lord over us or have power over us because we are not under the law but under grace. And what we were saying was that freedom from sin is freedom from the law. If you want to be freedom or I'm sorry, if you want to be free from sin uh, in your thoughts in your actions, um, if there are things that you're sitting there saying, man, I just, I know I need to stop doing this. This is not right, but I just can't stop. Um, part of that, part of the reason that we're being dominated by sin is because we're still um, putting ourselves under the law. If you want to come out of the domination of sin in your thoughts and in your actions, then there needs to be a total disconnection from the law. Now, what are we saying when we're saying um, there has to be a total disconnection from the law? Because, folks, this is it. Sin shall not have dominion over us. Not because we go to church a lot. Not because we read the Bible a lot. Not because we, uh, you know, uh, pray all the time. Which, that's all a part of this. Uh, we're not saying there's anything wrong with that. But what we have to understand is the scripture says that sin shall not have dominion over us because we're not under the law anymore. We're free from the law. So now, what does it mean to be free from the law? And what does it mean to totally disconnect from the law? Uh, well, we're free from the law in the sense that the law that was given by Moses that condemned us and judged us for our sins and uh, separated us from God and uh, released the curse of, of sickness, pain, disease, separation from God, and even eternal damnation in hell, that law has been fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. The judgment of that law was poured out upon Jesus upon the cross and so now we are not under the judgment of the law because Jesus was judged uh, in our place the judgment the wrath that the law um, pronounced on mankind was put on Jesus at the cross and so now we are free from the law in that uh, through Jesus, it's as if we've already been judged by the law. And so now we're not obligated to the law. We're not bound by the law. We're not under the curse of the law. We're not uh, uh, um, uh, receiving the judgment of the law in this life or the life to come. Jesus received it for us. So now we're free from the law. We're free from the obligations of the law, the the uh, not just the ceremonial law, but even the the Ten Commandments written on stone tablets, and and we'll we'll talk about that here in a moment. But we're free from the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Hallelujah. And so, 
the so because we're not under the law Romans 6 14 sin does no not any longer have dominion over us but here's the problem we continue to put ourselves under the law by operating in a performance mentality or a works mentality uh, we're not under the law Jesus fulfilled the judgment of the law and now uh, through our born again spirits we've been made the righteousness of God and we fulfill the righteousness of the law through our newly created born again spirits created unto good works Ephesians chapter 2 says so, so we're not under any obligation to the law, any bondage to the law. We're free from the law. Uh, but the reason sin still has dominion over us in our lives many times is because we're under the law in our mentalities. We are walking with a law mentality or a, a performance mentality or a works mentality. We're, we're living under the mentality that I've got to perform well, that I've got to do good, that I've got to read enough, pray enough, give enough, pay my tithes, go to church, and if I'll do these things, God will accept me and God will use me, and, uh, and, and, and if I sin or mess up, I need to hurry up and repent to get back into the favor of God, and all of that, folks, is a works mentality it's a law mentality and when you operate with a law mentality it keeps you under the dominion of sin hallelujah it keeps you under the dominion of sin and what we need to begin to do is uh, we need to begin to abandon self-effort Completely abandon uh, self-effort. And what do I mean by abandoning self-effort? Well, let, let's let's define what we're saying when we say abandon self-effort. Because uh, when you hear the message of grace and freedom from the law and freedom from works, then people's mindset many times automatically goes to well then what you're saying is I don't have to do nothing I can just sit back and and listen to secular music and 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 watch uh, filth on television and just uh, you know feed my flesh and everything's gonna be alright that's not what we're saying and I don't think there's a grace teacher that is saying that uh, when we're saying abandon self-effort, we're saying abandon the effort to make yourself right before God. Abandon the effort to make God love you, to make God move in your life. Abandon the effort to get God to heal you. That's what we're saying. We're not saying just sit back and do nothing. Uh, we're we're saying abandon the mentality uh, that I've got to put all this effort into uh, my relationship with God to get God to love me. No, you here's here's what you need to understand. You need to understand that no matter what you do, God loves you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he loves you, to make yourself any more righteous than you already are through your faith in Jesus Christ. And you need to abandon that effort and rest from your works, cease from your own works. Because there's nothing left for you to do to get God to love you any more than what he already loves you. But, this thing still involves effort, but not an effort motivated by a desire uh, or desperation to get God to love you or get God to accept you or get God to use you. But there needs to be an effort that's motivated by a love for God that is a result of your revelation of his love for you. 
See, everything I do, praise, worship, read my Bible, go to church, doesn't need to be motivated by a fear that God's going to reject me. Perfect love, 1 John 4, um, 18, I think, uh, somewhere around in there. Perfect love casteth out all fear. Fear uh, has torment. Those that have not been made perfect in love. Uh, fear, and I, and I didn't quote that exactly right, but uh, there is no love. Perfect love casteth out fear. There is no fear in love. When you begin to understand the love of God and how he loves you unconditionally, through the blood of Jesus, through what Jesus did at the cross, uh, it drives out any fear, any fear of punishment, any fear of God rejecting you. Hallelujah. And so now uh, we don't put effort forth motivated by fear to get God to accept us. Our effort is motivated by the love of God. My praise and my worship it is not uh, an effort put forth motivated by a desire uh, to keep God in my life or to have God be pleased with me. It's motivated out of a love for him that is a result of understanding his love for me. Hallelujah. So we're not saying abandon self-effort in regards to you know grace doesn't mean to sit out and do nothing but what grace uh, does is grace really empowers you causes you to live more on fire more righteous than you ever did uh trying to do it out of your own uh willpower hallelujah because what grace does is grace reveals to me uh, how much God loves me. And grace enables me to have a continuous, sustained relationship with God without condemnation, without guilt. And that relationship drives me uh, uh, to worship God, drives me to seek him, drives me to go to church, drives me to read my Bible. And, and that's not self-effort to uh, get God to accept me. That's effort that is a response to the fact that I'm already accepted by God. Hallelujah. And so this is uh, this is what what God is 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 looking for. Uh, grace doesn't mean set back and do nothing. Grace just means I'm going to be enabled to do more than I have ever done, because grace is uh, giving me an unhindered, or allowing me to have an unhindered relationship with God. But see, when I stay in that law mentality where I'm trying to uh, earn the righteousness of God with self-effort. It, it keeps me hindered. Sin just lords over me and has dominion over me because, well, we'll, we'll get into some things uh, here in the next few minutes if you'll hang out and listen to this video of teaching uh, where you'll, I think you'll begin to see some things. Hallelujah. But uh, let's look in, in Hebrews chapter 8 if you want to look there with me Hebrews chapter 8 and, and what we want to do is in Hebrews chapter 8 real quick is just look at the comparison of being under the law and and being under this covenant of grace that we're now under through Jesus Christ So we're, we're going to look here in Hebrews chapter 8. And let's look at, at, at verse 6. Let's see, it says, But now hath he, talking about Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry, by 
how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant, now when it says first covenant, it's talking about the covenant the uh, that God made through Moses, the Mosaic covenant. That's what we'll call it. If that first covenant, that covenant that came through Moses, uh, which was the law, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In other words, if the covenant God made with man through Moses under the law was, was able to, to, to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish, which was eliminate sin, make man righteous, uh, and put man back in right standing with him so that he could have a relationship with him. If it could have done that, then there would have been no uh, reason to establish a second covenant through Jesus Christ. Jesus wouldn't have even had to come. But the law could not make men uh, righteous in that, and I think the scripture says, it was weak through the flesh. In other words, the way the law worked to make men righteous was through the self-effort of the flesh. In other words, in order to be righteous under the law, you had to do it through works. You had to obey rules and regulations through the power of the flesh. But the flesh is weak. The flesh is unable to live up and line up to uh, the standard of God's law. Hallelujah. I believe um, Romans chapter 8 says, that the flesh cannot be submitted to the law. The flesh is not, cannot submit to the law of God. It's in a, it's incapable of submitting to the, to the law of God. And so the law wasn't going to work. It, it, there was fault with it because it worked through the flesh. The law put pressure on the flesh to live right. And the flesh could not handle it. So a second uh, covenant was sought after, which was this covenant of grace. And it begins to talk about that here. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the covenant we're in now, uh, and with the house of Judah. And he says this covenant. Verse 9. This covenant. This new covenant. That he has made with us through Jesus. Is not according to the covenant. That I made with their fathers in the day. When I took them by the hand. To lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not saith the Lord. So he says this covenant under Jesus. Uh, this covenant of grace is not according to, it's not like the covenant he made uh, with the forefathers when he took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So what covenant is he talking about? He's talking about the Mosaic covenant, the covenant under the law. He says this covenant's not like that covenant because under that covenant, under the law, they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. And so, uh, what he's saying here is that under the law, they did not keep my commandments, and so I disregarded them. Uh, the Amplified says uh, that Verse 9, the Amplified Version of verse 9 says, It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers on the day when I grasped them by the hand to help and relieve them and lead 
uh, out of the land of Egypt, for they did not abide in my agreement with them. So I withdrew my favor and disregarded them. And so under the law, this is, this is how it worked. Under the law, uh, man did not keep his commandments and then God withdrew his favor and, and, and did not regard them. And so under the law, uh, man's relationship with God was very up and down like a roller coaster, you know, uh, they, they, uh, gave in their first fruits and they worshiped God and God favored them. And then, uh, all of a sudden, you know, they blasphemed God. Uh, they picked up sticks on the Sabbath and, and, and all of a sudden God's favor was gone from them and they were, uh, facing death and they were facing droughts and they were facing famine and then they repented and, and, uh, begin to line back up and God favored them again. And it was, it was like that under the law. It was just up and down, just this roller coaster of a ride of, uh, uh, of a relationship with God, uh, God's favor being on them and God's favor being off of them, God's favor being on them and God's favor being off of them. And it always depended on their works. It always depended on their works under the law. If you are faithful, God is faithful. Under the law, you do and God will do. But if you don't do, God won't do. If you walk right, if you uh, do everything you're supposed to do, the favor of God uh, will be upon you. But if you don't, then the favor of God is, is withdrew. And under the law, the covenant is hinged on your faithfulness which just was weak and unstable and just not not going to happen and this is why he instituted the sacrifices and there was a continual flow of blood, if you will, of, of animals, because man could not keep the law. Man failed in every point of the law. And so under the law, God's faithfulness to man and God's favor on man uh, and God's blessing on man was based upon their works and their their deeds and so when you live under a law mentality this is how you think of God now this is not the way God is under the new covenant and we'll we'll see that here but this is how you think of God you think that every time I mess up every time I sin every time I fail God's turning his back on me God's pulling his favor off of me and I gotta hurry up and and repent and and beg and plead and and beat myself up and 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 get things right uh in order to kick God's favor back on me and under the law that becomes a cycle that you get in because you can't live good enough you can't walk righteous enough under the law to keep God's favor, if that's your mentality. But here's the thing, Un under uh, you're not under the law, and you need to disconnect from that law mentality because you are under grace. And under grace, God's favor and God's blessing and your righteousness and right standing with him is not based on what you do anymore. It's based on what Jesus did at the cross. Hallelujah. And you need to take the pressure off of yourself 
to keep this covenant intact, to keep God faithful. And you need to understand God's going to be faithful even when you're not faithful. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus did. And you need to quit putting your uh, faith in your flesh to live right, to make God uh, love me and accept me. And put your faith in the blood of Jesus and know that because of the blood alone, God's going to be faithful to you. And God's going to love you. Look at this. For this, verse 10, for this is the covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'm going to put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I'll be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And what he's saying here is under this new covenant, I'm not going to write laws upon stone tablets and 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 make them written rules and regulations for you to look at and follow through the effort of your flesh. But actually, I'm going to put these laws uh, and my ways and, and my righteous standard in your hearts and in your minds. And so you're not going to be living out of the effort of your flesh through rules and regulations uh, let me say it this way. You're not going to be living uh, out of the effort of your flesh trying to obey rules and regulations to be righteous. The Lord says, I will supernaturally put my righteous standard in you and you will be made righteous. You'll think righteous. You'll desire righteousness you'll want righteousness hallelujah and that's what he's done through the new creation the new birth they that are in christ are new creatures old things have passed away behold all things have become new we now have the holy spirit living on the inside of us and the nature of jesus on the inside of us and so now we don't need laws to tell us how to live we uh have got the nature of Jesus and we've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to guide us and, and teach us how to live. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of you begins to lead you and guide you into righteousness. And you begin to desire right things. And you begin to think right thoughts. Hallelujah. And that's Jesus living this life through you. And that's how we live under this uh, new covenant. Hallelujah. And it says in verse 11, uh, under this new covenant, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Under the law of uh, every generation had to teach the next generation about God. But he says, that's not necessarily going to be uh, necessary under the new covenant because under the new covenant, I'll be able to have a personal relationship with every individual believer and I'll be able to reveal myself to them, myself. Hallelujah. And then he says in verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Listen, under this new covenant, God is merciful to our unrighteousness. Under the law, uh, there was no mercy for our unrighteousness. There was judgment for our sin. But under the new covenant, he is merciful to our unrighteousness. Under the law, he was faithful if we were faithful. But under the new covenant, he's faithful even if we're not faithful. Hallelujah. That's powerful. That's powerful. And so, uh, What I have to understand in this new covenant is 
God's faithfulness is not based on my faithfulness. He's faithful even when I'm not faithful. He's favoring me, hallelujah, and with me even when I'm not faithful to him and I'm not favoring him and I'm not, you know, doing what I need to do. He's there. Now, why is that powerful? And 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 how does that help us come out from under the dominion of sin when, when we begin to understand that? Well, here's the thing about grace. And I think I said it earlier, but I'm going to reiterate it. Grace is not the abandonment of righteous works. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean that we're, we just, you know, live like devils. Um, but now if you're teaching grace the right way, then th that question is going to come up. It came up in Paul's ministry, you know. He, they said in Romans 6 and 1, well, shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase and, and, you know, we're under grace and there's no more judgment for sin and our sins are forgiven. So shall we just continue in sin? He says, God forbid, how can you that are dead to sin continue therein any longer? In other words, you died to sin. You've got a new nature now that's alive to God and, and righteousness. And, and that's what people don't think of when they hear the grace message. They say, well, you can't tell people all sins are forgiven and forever and, and there's no more judgment for sin. Folks, they, they say that, but they don't think. These people are new creatures. You're new creatures. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You don't need fear of punishment to keep you right. You've got the Holy Spirit to keep you right. Why, why choose the law and written regulations and the fear and the wrath of God to keep you right when you've got the very nature of Jesus on the inside of you? Hallelujah. That, the nature of Jesus and the Holy Spirit will keep you more righteous than, than operating under the fear of the law. Hallelujah. Because, well, when, and I don't want to get off point here, but when I am walking under the leading of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, there are things the Holy Spirit will tell me to do that, that I don't find in the law. Little things, he'll begin to speak to me here and there um, about things to do that are actually in line with God's righteous standard that you can't find just by reading in the law. It's not in here. But it lines up with God's ways, and the Holy Spirit will prompt me on those things. Uh, that's why it says he'll write them on our hearts and put his laws in our minds. And so there will be instances where you'll be in a situation and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind, you don't need to do that. And it's not written in here. You can't find it. It's not necessarily uh, one of the big ten, you know, uh, thou shalt not do this. But what happens is the Holy Spirit puts God's standard into our mind and we begin to see oh I don't need to do that he begins to prompt our hearts that we don't need to say a certain thing or, or do a certain thing and if you were just going by what's written you would you would miss that hallelujah but you now have got the nature of Jesus on the inside of you and he's living through you and he's directing your life and so now you're going to live more righteous under grace 
depending on the nature of Jesus on the inside of you, then you are living under a works mentality, trying to obey laws to be accepted by God. Thank you, Jesus. So now, here's the thing about grace. Grace is not the abandonment of righteousness. Grace really empowers us to live right. Because what grace does is grace enables us to have a sustained, sustainable relationship with God. Through which we can be empowered to live right. See, the thing about him being merciful to my unrighteousness is in his faithfulness and his favor being dependent on him instead of me is that allows me to sustain a relationship with him. The fact that he never leaves me, never forsakes me, hallelujah, is going to empower me to be able to come out of situations, to be able to grow. Hallelujah. I need God to go with me in those places where I'm failing. And, and, and I don't need him to leave me if I ever want to come out of it. Hallelujah. See, grace enables us, this new covenant, where he's merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins, he's not retaining in his mind. It, it enables me to stay in a sustainable relationship with him to the point that when I do fail, I know he's there and I can turn to him and he can empower me and strengthen me to come out of things that I'm in. Hallelujah. You know, I can be heading into sin and be right in the middle of some kind of sin and because he doesn't disregard me in that sin. He doesn't pull his favor or his presence away from me in that sin. He's right there with me in that sin. He can speak to me in the middle of that. And yeah, I may I, I may do some stuff that I shouldn't do, but he's right there in the middle of it speaking to me. Not condemning me, but convicting me. And there's a difference between being convicted by the Holy Spirit and being condemned. Because the Holy Spirit does not condemn, it convicts. And it convicts you based on your righteousness. It says to you, and, and let me say the word convict, um, a better translation would be convince. He begins to convince you of your righteousness in those moments. He says, you know, this is not who you are. Now, you are the righteousness of God and you're anointed. And, and, and so, you know, this is not who you are and you don't need to be doing this. You actually need to be uh, winning these people to the Lord that you're with and doing this stuff with. You you know you need to be in church right now. It's it's Wednesday night and you, you need to be over at the church because you're the righteousness of God. And, and, and this is not who you are. And so he begins to convince you of your righteousness, which in turn begins to cause you to see that man I shouldn't be doing this and it begins to pull you and push you out of out of those things now condemnation on the other hand comes from Satan and comes from your own heart and and condemnation doesn't deal with your righteousness it doesn't convince you that you're of your righteousness it convince you of your unrighteousness it it, it tells you how hopeless you are and helpless you are and how much of a, how worthless you are and how you'll, you'll never amount to anything. That's condemnation. But the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn. The Holy Spirit convicts. Hallelujah. And God in you, not disregarding you, being merciful to your unrighteousness. Hallelujah. And grace enabling you to have this relationship with God that's sustainable is what's going to cause you to conquer sin in your thoughts and your actions and in your life and cause you to live more holy every day. See, grace doesn't uh, 
Grace doesn't eliminate righteousness in your life. Grace actually empowers you to live righteous because grace enables you to have a relationship with God that's sustainable even in your mistakes that will cause you to walk in righteousness, that will empower you, hallelujah, to, to live right and to come out of things. Thank you, Jesus. But if you're under a law mentality, hallelujah, you will you will not hear the voice of the Lord that's in you. If you're under a law mentality, when you mess up, when you make mistakes, your mind thinks, well, God's left me. He doesn't love me. He's upset at me. So I can't turn to him. There's no way he would talk to me. Hallelujah. And so in that, with that mindset, that law mentality mindset, you're automatically putting yourself on your on your own saying well God's not with me he's not accepting me right now so so I've got to come out of this on my own and then many times you can't because your flesh is weak and you stay dominated by sin hallelujah or if you do come out through willpower and start living right, you eventually are going to fail again and be right back in the same cycle. And you'll get into that cycle enough to where you will say, forget it, I'm done, I can't live it, I'm not going back to church. And then you just run right on into sin. And sin stays Lord over your life because you're under a law mentality. Thank you, Jesus. But when you break that law mentality and you understand grace, and you understand God is going to love me no matter what I do. That his love for me, his presence in my life, my relationship is not based on anything I do. Hallelujah. But it's based on the blood of Jesus. Then you're going to be able to have a sustainable relationship. And through that relationship, he's going to empower you to come out. Empower you to be free. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's let's look at one other scripture here before we in this video teaching. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, talking about freedom from sin is is freedom from the law. We've got to come disconnect from from the law completely, even in our mentality, in order to, to be get free from sin in our, our thoughts and our actions. And, and to cause sin to quit dominating us so that we can do what God's called us to do. There's people sitting in pews not doing what God's called them to do because they don't think they're worthy enough to do it. They don't think they're worthy enough to preach. They don't think they're worthy enough uh, to be anointed. Hallelujah. And that comes from a law mentality. Or they get fired up for a little while just to fail and stop again because they're under a law mentality. Thank you, Jesus. But the anointing and the blessing of God is not based on your works. It was under the law, but you're not under the law. You're under grace. It's based on Jesus and the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you, if you disconnect from a law mentality, it will free you to obey the Lord. Look in Romans chapter 7. Look at this. Look at verse 5. I want to read this. I want to read this out of King James and out of um, the Amplified. Let me get it here in the Amplified. Romans chapter 7. All right. Verse 5. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Let me read that out of the Amplified. It says, uh, uh, 
when we were living in the flesh, mere physical lives, the sinful passions that were awakened and aroused up by what the law makes sin, were constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, so that we bore fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law and have terminated all intercourse with it, having died to what once restrained and held us captive. So now we serve not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the spirit in newness of life. In other words, what this was saying is that all the law ever did even the Ten Commandments. All the law ever did was stir up the passions of sin in the flesh. That's what it says here in verse 5. The sinful passions were awakened and aroused by the law, and it caused us to bear fruit unto death. Or in other words, it caused us to... Uh, sin in our thoughts and our actions. Folks, the law, and when we preach the law and live under the law, all the law does is stir up the sinful passions on the inside of us. Hallelujah. See, people think, it, you know, I'll get rid of sin by preaching on sin. I'll, you know, if there's sin and there's things going on in the church or in my life, well, um, you know, if there's sin going on in the church, well, I'll just, I, I got to preach on the sin. Uh, I got to preach the law, if you will. Thou shalt not. Or God's going to get you. I need to preach on that in order to get rid of the sin. But folks, all the law does is stir up the passions of, of sin in our flesh and cause us to sin. That's what this says. The law causes us to sin. And you don't get rid of sin by preaching on sin, by preaching the law. When you preach the law, hallelujah, all you're doing is stirring up sin and multiplying sin. Hallelujah. No wonder these churches today are in sin and there's so much sin going on in the pulpit and there's so much sin going on in leadership is because that's what we're preaching on. We're preaching the law and it's stirring up sin. It's stirring up the passions of sin. But notice what this says. Verse 6 said, we don't serve under the obedience of the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the Spirit in the newness of life. And so what this is saying is we don't we don't we don't produce righteousness out of obeying the written code or the law, the Ten Commandments. We produce righteousness by obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So under the un, under the law you obeyed written codes. But under grace, now, you obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And so what we need to teach is we need to teach relationship with the Holy Spirit if we want to get rid of sin. We need to teach how to hear the Holy Spirit. We need to teach how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. If we want to get rid of sin, because that's, uh, in this, this new covenant, that's how we walk in righteousness. By the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, uh, I think it's in Galatians. Let me look there. I'll, I'll read it to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. What's that saying? That's saying if you are full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit, you don't have to be under the law. You don't have to follow the law. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will prompt you 
to fulfill the standards of the law. So therefore, I don't need written regulations and written laws to tell me how to live right that I will try to obey through my flesh and fail doing it and fall into condemnation and then eventually give up. I've got the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit will lead me to live right. He'll prompt me to walk in righteousness. He'll prompt me to love. He'll prompt me to forgive. He'll prompt me uh, to, to put other people before me. Hallelujah. Look what it says. See, we don't need the law preached to us and we don't need the law to, to go by anymore you don't need to, to 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 come out of sin you don't need somebody to beat you up with the word and step on your toes all the time to get you uh out of sin you need to be led by the holy spirit because what that's going to do when, when you go to a church and, and somebody is just preaching the law to you all it's going to do is stir sin up in you and, and make you live in more sin. You need to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. See, when you look over here in verse 22, it says, of Galatians chapter 5, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. In other words, it's saying what the Holy Spirit prompts you to do or produces in you is not against the law. It's the fulfillment of the law. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you is not going to cause you to do anything that's unrighteous. Hallelujah. And so I don't want to try to live righteous through the weakness of my flesh when I can live righteous through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. So now, uh, look, at, look in Romans chapter 8, verse 4. It says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. When you follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, it will cause you to fulfill the righteousness of the law. So you are not under the law. Come out from under the law. Come out from under a works mentality. Come out from under a performance mentality. God is going to love you no matter what you do. Hallelujah. He's going to love you no matter what you do, no matter what mistakes you make. Come out from under the law and begin to walk in a relationship with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit prompt you to live right. Let the Holy Spirit prompt you to walk in righteousness. And you'll live more righteous living by the promptings of the Holy Spirit than you ever have trying to live out of your flesh and obey certain laws. Thank you, Jesus. Look in verse 7 and 9 of Romans chapter 7. Let me, let, let's read this. I'm, I'm going to give you just uh, a couple more scriptures here, and I'll shut this thing down. Romans chapter 7. Look at, look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God, for, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of uh, concupiscence. And I know I didn't say that word right. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Let me read that out of the Amplified. What then do we conclude? Is the law identical with sin? 
Certainly not. Nevertheless, if it had not been for the law, I should not have recognized sin or have known its meaning. For instance, I would not have known about covetousness, would have had no consciousness of sin or sense of guilt if the law had not repeatedly said, you shall not covet and have an evil desire for one thing and another. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment to express itself, got a hold on me and aroused and stimulated all kinds of forbidden desires, lust, covetousness. For without the law, sin is dead. The sense of it is inactive and a lifeless thing. Once I was alive, but quite apart from and unconscious of the law but when the commandment came sin lived again and I died was sentenced by the law to death folks what he's saying here is the law not just the ceremonial law people say well we're not under the ceremonial law but we're still under the Ten Commandments folks he pointed out one of the Ten Commandments so we're not just talking about the ceremonial law. We're talking about the, 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 the Ten Commandments. The law is written on stone tablets. He said that law, what it did was it caused sin to be revived in me. He said, I didn't have any guilt. I didn't have any consciousness of sin until the law came. But when the law came, I die or or uh I died and sin revived. Hallelujah. He said when the law came saying I shall not covet, he said, verse eight, sin found an opportunity in that commandment. Hallelujah. Found an opportunity in that commandment. And got a hold on me and aroused and stimulated these forbidden desires of lust and covetousness. In other words, what he's saying is the law stimulated sin in my life. He said before the law came, he said it up here in verse 7, that he said before the law came, I was not conscious of sin. It wasn't even in my mind. But what the law did was, the law brought sin consciousness to my mind and stirred up my thoughts concerning sin and stirred up passions in me concerning sin and it got a hold on me and drove me to sin. Hallelujah. Folks, this is very simple. And what this is saying is, that when the law is preached, the law stirs up sin. It revives sin. Hallelujah. If we want to stop sin or limit sin in our lives and in the church, we've got to come out from under the law. The law stimulates sin in us. Hallelujah. Look at uh, verse 10, and we'll just read this out of the Amplified. It says, And the very legal ordinance, which was designed and intended to bring life, actually proved to mean to me death. For sin, seizing the opportunity and getting a hold on me by taking its incentive from the commandment, beguiled and entrapped and cheated me, and using it as a weapon, killed me. The law, therefore, is holy, and each commandment is holy and just and good. Did that which is good then prove fatal, bringing death to me? Certainly not. It was sin, working death in me by using this good thing as a weapon, in order that through the commandment sin might be shown up clearly to be sin, that the extreme malignity and immeasurable sinfulness of sin might plainly appear. This said in verse 11, sin took occasion by the commandment and slew me. The word occasion in the Greek means a place from which an attack is made. 
the law gives sin a place to attack my life from. Sin, the, the law is not bad. The law is good. The law, is it, it reveals to us God's standard of righteousness. There's nothing wrong with the law, but what happens is sin will use the law as a platform to dominate and attack our lives from. In other words, if, if I recognize, uh, maybe as a pastor, that there is a, a spirit of pornography working in the church or a perverted spirit of lust, sexual lust and immorality in the church. And let's say I preach on pornography and I preach on sex and how it's bad and it's wrong and God hates it and da 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 because God does hate sin. Let's not say I'm not saying God loves sin or anything like that. He hates sin, he detests sin. But if I, I preach the law and preach from a law mentality, all I'm going to do when I begin to preach on sex and preach on immorality and preach on pornography, I'm going to stir up the passion and the desire to do it. Uh, Paul said, I didn't have no consciousness. I didn't have no guilt. It wasn't a thought in my mind until the law came. And when the law came, it stirred it up in my mind. It stirred it up in, in my life. And it woke up these passions in me. The law wakes up these things in us. Hallelujah. And so if, if I want to limit the sin, I don't need to preach on it. I need to begin to preach on who you are in Christ and how righteous we are and, and how anointed we are and how much God loves us. Thank you, Jesus. And by speaking those things, I can ignite uh, uh, a change in people, hallelujah, that will bring righteousness. But if I, I preach on the law, it's just going to stir it up. It's like when I tell my kids not to do something. I've learned by ministering this grace message how to deal with my kids. There are times that... There are things I don't want them to get into, and I'll get ready to tell them, don't get into that, and I'll just shut my mouth because I know once I tell them not to do it, there's going to be no temptation to do it until I tell them not to do it. Once I tell them not to do it, I stir up their curiosity. I stir up the passion and the desire to do it. But if I don't tell them to do it, they don't even think about it. And listen, you can't be tempted with what you don't think about. And what the law does is the law stirs it up in your thoughts and stirs it up in your mind. Hallelujah. You know, I would maybe wasn't even thinking about pornography. I wasn't even thinking about uh, lust or women. But the preacher begins to preach on it. And now all of a sudden these pornographic thoughts and these images of women start coming up into my mind. That now I have to go out of that service and fight right or if if i've been dealing with it i got to go out of there condemned and guilty hallelujah and maybe not even repent it maybe just feeling like well what's the use and then going right back into it but nonetheless sin will take an opportunity the law gives sin an opportunity to overpower our lives uh, verse 13 said that sin uses the law like a weapon to slay me. Man, when you preach law, what you're doing is you're putting a weapon into the hand of sin. We still have sinful passions and sinful nature in our soul and in our flesh. Our spirit's been redeemed and sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's something I teach. But we still have sinful passions in our flesh. And when you preach the law, you put a weapon in the hands of sin to destroy your life, to either cause you to sin or to just beat you up over the sin you've committed. One way or the other, the law gives sin power over you. 
And if you want to be free from sin, you've got to come out from under the law. Plain and simple. You got to come out from under it in under a law mentality, a performance mentality, and you've got to come out from under law preaching. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I hope this blessed somebody, helped somebody. Uh, if it did, share it. Uh, but we love you, and uh, be blessed. Come out from under the law. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Hallelujah.